I fully believe myself that if, if we still have something out there when we're dead, and they say we do, well, uh, it's going to be an awful boring place if there's no birds or animals. <laughs> you know, I mean, who wants to go, eh? Ever since I was young, I loved animals. Tame and wild. My dad and I would drive around the back roads of the Kootenays in hopes of seeing wildlife. I loved to just watch them in their habitat. Wild, free. But it doesn't look the same as when I was young. It doesn't feel the same. Everything's bigger. There's just a little more of us and a little less of them. When I was 17, my entire outlook of how we coexist with wildlife changed forever. To this day, that memory still haunts me. I remember sitting in my car. I didn't know what to do. And when I finally got out, I couldn't find her. I couldn't help but wonder, what would I have done if she were lying on the road, injured? Or if she had a baby fawn with her? Where would I take her? That's when I heard about a woman who lived out on a farm, who cared for injured and orphaned wildlife. Her name is Helen Jameson, and this is her story. How would I describe Helen? She's a lot of personality. Tough as nails was a heart of gold for animals and people too. A very strong, determined lady, um, willing to do anything she can for wildlife. She's the kind of person that would never let an animal suffer. I think she's definitely one of a kind. I mean, I'm sure there are other people like her, but I don't know them, and I've never heard of them. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that are close, but not close enough. My mom taught me how to use the chainsaw. She's a tough girl. She can build a shed, she can build a pen, or at least she could anyways, and she did lots of that. We moved to Blewett back in 1965, and she found a spot here that was just perfect for what she liked, and maybe not for everybody else, but <laughs> <laughs> perfect for what she wanted because it was big and out in the wild, and, and she could do what she wanted to do. I was the bird lady, the bear lady, the coral, oh, all these names, you know, for miles around, miles and miles around. They just threw a name on me, and, uh, and as far as they were concerned, that's what I looked after. Well, I was a pretty small kid at that time, so I don't really remember exactly how it started. All I remember is being there, and there was no animals at all, and then the animals slowly started coming in until there were more animals than there were kids. <laughs> See, I always had these full of things. What used to be in here? Whatever came, you just had to find a place to put them get them in so they'd be safe. Does it make you sad to see these cages and not see any animals in them anymore? It does to a degree, but uh, I just try to have a life and trying to give as much stuff as I possibly can a life at the same time. But now you see, I got too old and uh, it just doesn't work out that good anymore. So my mother always said, you go out and help dad do the work outside because he works hard. And I learned how to milk cows and I learned how to do all those kind of things. And I was in my glory because uh, I'm helping dad. I'm helping, I don't want to help mother. Ugh. I didn't want to be doing cooking and dishes and stuff. That, oh no, that was never me. I hated that idea. But I could work out there like a trooper. This whole thing started with Someone brought her an animal. She said, I could probably help. And that was it. She just hasn't stopped going since then. I think I got involved with the wildlife. They needed somebody to help. Somebody who wouldn't be afraid. Most people are afraid of animals, especially wild ones. That was just something that I grew up doing. And when we first got this place, I guess, well, the next thing I know, well, I had kids coming in and saying, oh, I got this little bird, and I was wondering, nobody knows how to look after it. Do you know how to look after this little bird? And I said, oh, sure. It'd be easier to mention the animals that weren't in our backyard <laughs> than the animals that were in our backyard. We had everything in our backyard. It was crazy. There was a lot of animals there. 
There's a lot of herd animals, a lot of healthy animals. She looked after them all. When I'd stop in, she'd have, she'd always have something different. Everything from flying squirrels to small birds to ungulates, whether that's deer, or elk, or moose. She has had bears and elk and cougars and deer, birds and the like, you know, right down to like little tiny lizards that are sick or broken. Even mice. She'd look after mice. She, I could not believe it. When I was a kid, she had a box of mice that she was bringing back to life. And I was, as a kid, I was like, Mom, don't we get rid of those? And she says, no, we're going to you, we're going to fix them. <laughs> what used to be in here? All kinds of things. It all worked out and we were all happy and we, we just uh, did what we did. I mean, I just had everything. Everything. I'm surprised you didn't have a giraffe. I would have had one, but you couldn't get them around here. <laughs> I liked everything. And I don't think there's anything really that lives that hasn't lived in our house. The only thing I didn't like is I didn't like the snakes. And that was all my brother's fault, because when we were kids, he threw that snake and it went rough. I thought I'd die for sure, you know. Yeah, mom used to look after lots of animals and if they couldn't be outside, she'd just bring them in the house. And she had these two little raccoons there at one time and uh, one of them was really, really curious. So this one raccoon learned how to flush the toilet and he was always in, in there flushing the toilet all the time. We used to love him as a kid. Oh, rascal, he loved water, eh? He'd drain my whole pool. He had a ball doing that. The main reasons for animals coming into her care is because they're hurt. It's very rarely that she would get an animal that is not needing some kind of help. It's 24-7. If you talk to Helen, she'll tell you, you know, depending on what kind of animal it is, some of them she had right in her house, you know, that required constant care. It's a full-time commitment. There was one little bear cub, I remember, she must have picked out hundreds of little wood ticks out of it, and it was scrawny, almost dead, but she got the wood ticks out, and next thing it was a roly-poly, fat little cute bear cub again. Everybody said, no, what's the point? It's just gonna die. No, Mom brought it around. That's where she gets her sense of accomplishment, I think, when it comes around, it's normal again. She loves the bears. Of all the wild ones, the bears were her favorite. Helen told me that when she was young, there was a traveling circus that came to town, and she saw a bear all chained up. And she was so disgusted that this wild creature was all chained up and, and living this terrible life that she said, Dear Lord, when I grow up, I want to look after the animals. Big bears, little bears, grizzly bears, it didn't matter. They all came one time or another. They got no business to be in a circus. A bear should be free. I'll do everything I can to save the bears. That's why I got the bear pen. I'd have made a much bigger pen than that, but I didn't have enough money. It cost a lot of money to build that pen. In order to have those things and look after them properly, I had to have a job. So I worked night shift for the Nelson City Police. And I would be in there by quarter to, well, 3.30, quarter to four, and work till midnight. And then I would come home, get a little bit of sleep, get some work done and uh, go back to work again. That was just my way of life. A busy person is a happy person. I don't think she did sleep and she probably barely ate. She was always go, 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 go. Not worked hard all her life. It's my understanding that Helen's never had any kind of formal support for what she does out on her farm. She's just something that she wanted to do herself over the years. I believe there's been different people in our community that have helped her out with various things out there, but for the most part, everything she does is out of her own pocket and out of the goodness of her heart. I've never known anyone that has tried and has helped as much as she has over 50 years of doing this for zero. She's always just trying to help. What used to live in here? Everything, elk cows, moose cows, whatever. Not the bear cubs, because the bear cubs could climb out, but other things that came in and they were just little. Did you make this? Yes, I did. I did. Well, it was a question of, uh, if you need it, you better make it. Because uh, nobody else gonna come along and do it for you. When Helen first came to me looking for a discount on goat milk, I thought there's gotta be something more I can do for her. And I didn't know if, Helen would be interested in doing something like this. I didn't know if the local paper 
would be interested in a story like this and I didn't know if the community would be interested in supporting something like this and I couldn't have been more wrong on every level. The community support was incredible so she was over the top with the funds that came out of that which helped her the rest of the year for what she needed for those animals. It's very exciting to see newspaper articles come out about my mom. It's my mom. So it's nice that she's had some of the recognition over the years. And the recognition that she gets, she doesn't think that she really should get it because she just does stuff that she loves doing. The communities come together in a few different ways. I know people that have gotten together to help rebuild some of the old structures on her property that were starting to fall apart and, and decay with age. She asks for nothing and she gives everything and it's all about the love for animals. The community is definitely behind her and what she's doing out there right now, definitely. I've taken my kids to see her and, and they've had flying squirrels that my kids have been able to hold. They don't forget that kind of stuff. Oh, when I was a teacher at Bluewood Elementary School, I thought it was really important that they meet local people that were making a difference. And so I reached out to Helen, was able to take my class to see her animals and her property. But also we fundraised over the years to buy food for these animals. And she sometimes would drop by the school just to say hi to the kids and pick up whatever we had raised for her. I think that Helen does connect kids to the wildlife. I'm sure there's kids out there from the Blewett area that remember Helen from years ago. She's been doing this for a long time. And I'm sure there's kids that are adults now with their own kids that are telling stories about Helen from back in the day. Everybody's kids from miles around came here. Little kids, big kids. And they brought the school buses out. The big, the big long, one was orange and one was sort of yellow, eh? They put two of them down there one day. Sheba, don't chase the cat, please, thank you. And they so, so loved it. It was so good for them to be able to come to a place like this where they could actually run. And then there was the bear pen, and there was the cougar pen, and there was the fawn pen. And, and they had their little cameras, and they're taking little pictures, and they're trying to stand really close and saying, couldn't they see me? Couldn't they see me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can see you, okay. And to this day, kids still love to come here, even when I don't have that abundance of stuff anymore, eh? I think they really admired Helen and thought she was an amazingly magic person and the way that she tried to rehabilitate these animals and put them back into nature. The wildlife that Helen had at her place were all there for a reason. They were all orphaned wildlife or injured wildlife that needed help. And she was very good about making sure people didn't get hands on with the wildlife because that doesn't help them in the long run. Helen has definitely spread that message that, that wildlife needs to stay wild. I bring my kids over to see Helen as much as I can as well because it's a good way to have younger generations understand that helping people does not always have to be a paid thing. She's made the community proud, proud that they have somebody so special and they appreciate her. She's one of the threads of the community. Wildlife rehabilitators are special people. They take care of orphaned and injured animals that have almost no other avenues of survival. What they're doing is contributing to making the world a better place. Helen and people like her are a big part of helping people relate to wildlife in a more compassionate and respectful way, which is what's so critical. With Helen retiring, the wildlife branch I don't think they've got anything locally at the time for the animals that fit the criteria for rehabilitation. We just have to work a bit harder to find a place for them. If it's something that we can save, we will. But yeah, in the event where there um, isn't rehab options and you have a truly injured or orphaned animal, there's very little options for that animal. Really, it's leave it be and let nature take its course or euthanasia. My name is Moshe Oz, and I'm a vet here. Tell me about Gilbert, how you found him. A client uh, brought him in and said that he has an injured phone. Uh, he had a broken leg, and it was an older injury. My thought was to amputate the leg and actually have a prosthesis. At the time, I consulted a surgeon, consulted so many people to try to make sure that medically-wise is feasible, and it was. So I said, okay, now we need to find a facility to, he cannot just be here in the hospital. This is when the problem started. So then I got the phone calls from the conservation officer and basically from the BC government. And the, the idea is we 
cannot transfer Gilbert. Not as a government, we don't want to take wild animals from one space to another to make sure that we don't have any kind of diseases spreading around. So I was limited of having a facility here in the Okanagan. So many clients, so many people that reached to me with amazing ideas and an ability to help, but at the end of the day, we couldn't find a facility. And then come to the point that they say, we have to, we have to, to do it. We have to put Gilbert down. It was very hard. And I never ever intended to do wildlife. It's just that people kept bringing this stuff in, you know. And uh, the conservation officer finally came in and he said, um, I heard you have a pet fawn. I said, I don't have a pet fawn. I have a very tame one, but uh, she's got a badly broken leg and nobody wanted to have her shot or killed. Everybody knew Bonnie and that was just the uh, way of life. Did Bonnie have babies that she would bring back? Always. Home? Sometimes she had three, sometimes she had two. One, once she had four. And I said, four? What are you doing with four fawns? Oh my Lord, you need extra food. <laughs> so do you think that wildlife should stay wild? Well, she was wild. I mean, she was free to go. She could go wherever she pleased. She just that she came right here to the steps and said, I come for a bottle of milk, Mommy. And you could always pet her. You could never touch those babies. They'd always stand way back and watch. They were wild. They were wild. And when Bonnie finally did die, Bonnie was buried on this property. So she always, this will always be her home. I felt that they had as much right to live out free around here as we do. I mean, this is their home too. You can't just say, oh, well, you can't, you can't live here, I'm living here. You know, I can make the connection between an animal that's injured for whatever reason. You can say, oh, isn't it too bad that animals get killed on the road? Oh, well, civilization sucks. Or you can say, no, let's do something about that. This is a problem that we can solve. The roads take a toll. The roads take a terrible toll. So that's uh, where 90%, I would say, they come from. And when they've got their young with them, they can't run fast, so they wait for the baby. So slow down. Just slow down when you're in a, an area that you know that there is wildlife around. When wildlife exclusion systems are built, they include wildlife underpasses, wildlife overpasses, and wildlife exclusion fencing. All of these components work together to be a system to protect wildlife by removing the chances that they approach the highway, but also offering them opportunities to safely cross either under or over the highway. Have you ever seen those wildlife crossings along the highway? I think they're great. They need more of them though, because it's, sometimes it's a long span between extremely important that we have people like Helen and people that devote their life for the love of wild animals and animals as a whole uh, because A, they give them voice and B, they actually help on a daily basis. I can do one thing here, one thing there, but they on a daily basis help and feed and rehabilitate and, and give them shelter and food and, and home. Yeah, look at his eye. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? He's just gorgeous. Yeah, like that one where the moose is kissing you. Yeah, I guess most of them probably grew old and died, like me, you see. Mm -hmm. I sh not quite made it yet, but... Maybe they're still running around like they you. They could be. Well, their offspring will be. Yeah. Their offspring yeah. will be. The bears. Yeah, I love the bears. They're one of my very favorites. Yeah. Well, they obviously loved you. They did. They <laughs> always loved me. Helen's connection with animals is absolutely special. She connects with them and she remembers them all. So you, you can sit down with her and she'll remember when, when that happened and what the animal was and what happened with it and the circumstances. My mom's connection with animals was really strong, but she would talk to them. They would understand what she'd say. You know, she would, she'd go out there, you'd hear her talking away and she'd be having a conversation with the animal and they'd be 
laughed. They looked like they're smiling away right back at her and talking to her too, you know. Was... She certainly had some that thought they were her, she was mom and um, there was a Canada goose. She'd go in the house and it would sit outside and the minute it came out, it would start squawking at her like, why would you leave me out here alone? And, and, and follow her everywhere she went one step at a time. That stupid thing. And I took it down to the water, a long way down to the water. And I put it in the water, and I said, there you go. Have a nice life. I look after you long enough. Now all the rest of these nice geese out here go, oh, well, everything. The bloody thing beat me home when I got back up here driving. It was already here. <laughs> and she had to do that several times until it finally got the idea that it was time to go out with his friends. <laughs> She's mama. Even when the bear, the bear was there, the cub. He looked at her like, oh, is it okay, Mama, that this person's here? The animals definitely liked it there. They knew it was a sanctuary for them to, to be there, and lots of other animals around came around just because it was a safe place to be. I loved all those things, you know. That was a good life. I had a good life, you know. I got lonely a lot of times. I, I still do, but that's uh, That's, that's why life. you got us next door. That's right. She seems to be very content out on her farm. That's her passion out there. Obviously loves animals. Helen's had a lot of tragedy in her life. I think those animals have helped her as much as she's helped them. Oh yeah, I had a lonely life because I've, uh, I've lost three husbands and two kids. It'll make you lonely in a hurry. I had a daughter. She drowned. And then I had a little boy. He got cancer and he died. That, uh, that basically was the story of my life. It's just been tough in a lot of ways, but I didn't give up the wildlife because that helped me too. They really helped me to handle all this other stuff. There is a growing gap right now, yes. There is people that are telling her that she can't retire. She has to continue looking after the animals. and They do need to find somebody else that can replace her. And they do need to do it quickly because there's a lot of animals out there that are going to need help here. She would still care for animals if she could? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. She'll, she'll be caring for animals until the day she dies. Where about the grouse? There you go. There she is, right in there. Can we bring the cage down or take her to the cage? Yeah, you can open it up and I'll reach in and get it. Okay. She can still fly over there. Okay, well, you just move okay. over it very far. Okay, not very far, okay. <laughs> there we go. There it is. I'd recognize the grouse anywhere. Yeah, you're one of a kind. <laughs> oh. I've given it water just by pouring it on her beak. Oh yeah, that's good for you. Off and on all day. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and uh, but I didn't know how to give her food, so. That's okay. I'll put her out in a cage and uh, and then she can move around, fix her feathers, and I've had lots of them over the years, so no problem. <laughs> and, uh, it's limping on the left leg. Okay. We got hit by a car. Oh. It was on the road. Yeah. Okay, so. Just concerned about the cold evening, uh, oh, giving her yeah. hypothermia. No, no, I will. I won't. No, I have cages in the house. Right on. Now we're I talking. always have cages in my house. Now we're talking. <laughs> there you <laughs> She's still a very strong woman. Her love for animals has not changed, uh, other than maybe getting stronger. But uh, <laughs> no, she's still the great person she was back in 1965 when you originally came here. So no, she would never hesitate. She would just go and do whatever had to be done. Just. No matter what anybody else saw, it, everybody else is, ah, ah, and she'd just go do it. Can you tell me the story of uh, Helen climbing the power line to put the osprey back in the nest? Uh, there was more than one. I think there was three, and they're almost full grown looking. I said, Helen, what are you doing up there? I mean, the power poles are huge to begin with, and this humongous ladder up there. And she's that kind of woman. You tell her not to, she'll do it anyway. Well, the conservation officer is afraid of heights, so see what are you gonna do? Somebody's got to go up to that osprey's nest and put these little ospreys, and they're cute as buttons, eh? But they can't fly, they're babies. The nest is way, way up, way, way up, and it's way up over the water, you know, <laughs> and I put them back in the nest, 
And the old mother there, she's flying around and around, and when she sees me getting close to the nest, she lands on a tree or something, and she watches, 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 watches. And I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this time, make sure they don't fly off the edge of the nest. And if I fall and break my neck, well, I don't know who's going to be sorry, but anyway, I'm going up. Yes, I know. A lot of people are afraid to pick anything like this up because they could get scratched or they're afraid of getting bit, really. But I've been bit with much more worse things than birds. She doesn't hold grudges against anything, like she even the cougars. why he would do it to her. The cougars and the bears coming in kill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> She'll question, well, why? You know, I'm helping you. I'm helping your friends. <laughs> and why do you come in and hurt what I'm trying to fix here? But she never, never gets mad or any no hostility towards those other animals at all. She will protect the ones that's hurt and try to scare the other ones away, but she won't hurt them or call them names or anything. No. But one of the ones that really sticks out in my mind was the cougar mm -hmm. that was there that had broken legs. And that was really scary for me because it didn't like people and it didn't really like mom either, you know, and she has scars to prove that <laughs> it wanted her to keep her distance. And But it had to be looked after and she made it better and she let it go and it all worked out fine, but uh, it was very, very scary. Yeah, I got lots of scars. If you're going to deal with wildlife, you'll get scars over the years. Yeah. Pretty bird, eh? Of course, I, I used to have hundreds of these doggone birds and things like that, but I tried to get somebody else to do it, but nobody, there's no money in it, eh? It's all your own expense. I'm not a go-to-town kind of a person to live. And I'd look out my window, and instead of seeing a deer or a bear or a cougar or whatever, I'm looking right into somebody else's house. No, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. I can't. No, I, I'm not that kind of a person. Again, it's not something I can really express in words, but everything I do is comes from her. Just thinking about it makes me almost want to cry. <laughs> my, uh, my whole idea of life in general is that uh, when it's my time to die, I wish to die right here at home. Now it's going to be hard on my family, and it's going to be hard on my friends, and it's going to be really hard on a lot of the wildlife. Let you stretch your legs and all that sort of stuff and then take it in the house for the night. Keep it warm. Story of my life. <laughs> I always end up with all these things. Did you get a picture of it? There you go. Yeah, you'll be okay now. You're safe now. Yeah, I'll never, uh, I'll never get away from the wildlife as long as I live. And when I'm dead, Edward, people are going to be coming banging on your door and saying, "Is your mom around?" I got this, and you're going to say, no, I'm sorry, she's not here anymore. And they'll say, well, what am I going to do with it? The day will come and I'll be gone. But I know one thing, I'll never be forgotten. Though these four walls may contain you, for a time I'll keep you close. I know you, you must go. Your temporary keeper, a mother just the same. What is a mother by any other name? Still, some things always stay one. Stay.